I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered and to pay my respects to elders past and present. And thank you um, so much um, to Rob and to the Executive Committee um, for the opportunity to be with you here today. Um, the Twitter junkies among you will probably know that I've just had 10 days off and this is my re-entry into work and I couldn't think of a better, nicer way to be doing it. So it's lovely to see you all. And I see from your agenda um, you've got a lot of issues to be working through population and workforce planning, service delivery and infrastructure, connectivity both physical and digital among other topics and I think that this reflects um, the great growth of Rural Councils Victoria since you took that step a few years ago now um, to stand alone and I know that um, Tawong and Juliana provide um, great momentum for the ongoing advancement of your agenda and I certainly hope you have a good session with the Treasurer because we've got lots in common. <laughs> um, so to each and every one of you, um, Victoria's 38 rural councils, um, we know and recognise that you play a critical role in strengthening uh, the economy and the social fabric of Victoria, um, whether it is in planning or responding to the real issues that affect your communities. And as a government, um, we're all very proud, I'm certainly very proud, of um, the relationship that we have with our rural councils um, as a group through RCV and the, and the different advocacy groups that you work um, as part of and with rural councils individually. Um, 23 of you are in my own electorate, so um, it's always been a relationship that I've valued enormously. Um, and it is one that's appreciated um, with a warm and genuinely respectful relationship. And of course, we won't always agree on everything all the time, uh, but strong advocacy is so important uh, and um, considered thought uh, into, um, into your advocacy and into your efforts uh, is always very welcome. And we did have a great, a great chat a few weeks ago um, in my office. Um, so again, a very warm welcome to all of you. So I wanted to share um, some thoughts with you today on two key themes, fairness and getting things done. Um, something our government and Rural Councils Victoria have in common, I think, is a belief in the notion of fairness and the notion of a fair go. It's very much an intrinsic part of our national identity indeed, but I think it's particularly strong in our rural areas. Um, I consider myself to be a passionate advocate for our regions, um, and I think our regions deserve our fair share and for people in regional Victoria to be able to fulfil um, their full potential. Um, as Rob said in the introduction, I grew up in Castlemaine in the Mount Alexander Shire, it was a wonderful, wonderful community, population of around 7,000 people and I went to school with kids from much smaller communities um, than Castlemaine and of course, you know, we had cities like Bendigo not so far for, for some services that we accessed. Um, but whether it's about ensuring that a kid in country Victoria receives the best possible education they can at school or that everyone has access to high quality healthcare services, um, I think what's important is that this can be the case no matter where you live, no matter what your postcode. And of course the infrastructure projects that I know is um, always at the forefront of the minds of councillors. Um, road, rail, digital, big projects, um, but also those small projects. Pyrenees here. Hello. Um, we had a lovely, lovely day um, just recently, um, a, a, a great project, uh, the Three Halls project in three small communities and we spent the Saturday going from one to the next to the next and it was just, I think, one of the finest examples that I've seen um, of the importance of the small infrastructure projects and um, that Pyrenees will also talk to us about upgrading the Western Highway and, and water, big, big water infrastructure projects. But, but it's really, really important to recognise, and I know you all know this, that those very small projects can also be incredibly important. Um, and, we, and we do this, we invest in these things because 
we want the parents of our rural communities to be able to raise their families, to pay off their homes and to enjoy a great quality of life, to have economic security and confidence about the future. Whether their workplace is a farm or a small business, whether they're in a profession or a trade. And the other thing that rural councils and our government have in common uh, is our fierce opposition to cuts to services because I think we all know through lived experience, hard lived experience, that cuts to services do hit rural communities the hardest. And the public sector is really important source of employment in regional Victoria, um, as well as delivering all of those services that we all access every day. 12% of the regional pub, um, uh, workforce is from the Victorian public service. Then you add in all the people who work for all of your councils and the, and, the, and the regional cities councils as well, and all of the federal government public sector employers as well, and it's 16% of the workforce. The questions for Victorians living in regional and rural Victoria in late November this year will be about these things. Um, who do people think will get things done? Who will best deliver the services that families need? Um, who can be trusted to not cut essential services, whether it's schools, health, the CFA. Um, when we came to government in 2014, um, things had been a little quiet. Um, and I don't, I don't want to sort of dwell on, you know, an unnecessary critique of the former government, but things did get a little quiet there for four years. Unemployment was on the rise. There was little in the way of job creation. We had um, TAFEs that were closing their doors. Public sector um, reductions were resulting in regional offices closing. $120 million had been taken out of V-Line and um, particularly in some of our rural communities, our ambulance service was in crisis. Um, there'd not been a single train carriage ordered for the first uh, two years in um, the, uh, so when um, Ted Ballew was Premier, uh, and cuts to the education budget had been so significant and there was not that planning work done that not a single school opened across Victoria in 2016 in spite of the you know, great population growth that's occurring in our state. And for reasons that I will never understand, funding was stopped for the National Centre for Pharma Health in Hamilton, which is based in Hamilton, but services all of your communities. And the Rural Women's Network was quietly closed down. So when we came to government in 2014, we promised to get regional Victoria back on track. And our government, um, if it's focused on the one thing, um, it's on getting things done. Um, we do work at a pretty frenetic pace, as you may have noticed. <laughs> um, so where are we today now? three and a half years later, unemployment is going down, there's record jobs growth, um, more schools are being upgraded and built, the TAFE repair project is well underway, more to do there for sure, but it's well underway. Um, health funding in the state is 20% higher than it was a few years ago, and those ambulance response times are better than they've been in seven years. And the budget's in surplus, which is, of course, important to be able to continue to make those investments. But there's lots, lots more that we want to do. Um, so over the last few years, we've focused on the fundamentals, delivering those key services and growing jobs. And there's some headline figures that I'd just like to share with you. So I imagine I've certainly tried to share some of these with you before. So since 2014, um, through our budgets, the government's invested $8.5 billion in regional Victoria, the last budget alone, $4 billion in infrastructure and services. Um, the federal government uh, is very New South Wales centric. I think that's just a, just a statement of fact. Around 45% of their infrastructure spending is in New South Wales, 25% in Queensland, and Victoria has to um, make do with 10%. And we continue to press the case with the federal government for a more equitable share where 25% of the population and where at least 25% of the economic activity. Um, but in spite of that, um, 
since the government came to office, 58,000 jobs have been created in regional Victoria and that's a wonderful testament to um, the innovators and entrepreneurs and employers um, in all of your communities. Um, there are things that government can do to make their task more um, uh, easier, uh, but that's, you know, that's a lot of confidence in a lot of communities and a lot of confidence in a lot of individuals. It's ten times more the job creation in regional Victoria that occurred uh, in the previous three years. And our regional Victorian um, employment growth rate is double the national rate. So regional Victoria is stronger um, than... Um, than uh, than uh, re well than regional Australia, if you if you were to try and separate them out, and we have doubled the school infrastructure spend um, for regional and rural schools. And I was just catching up with Eric Brassless from Golden Plains just a second ago, um, and I've not caught up with Eric since he um, moved from was Gunnawarra to um, Golden Plains, um, but. Uh, there is a magnificent new school at Bannockburn, um, which we're very, very proud to have supported. The first time I met the Golden Plains Shire, um, Rod Nichols, who would be well known to everyone in this room, I contacted myself and Gail Tierney. Before we'd even been elected, we'd been pre-selected, and he said, right, you two, come on time to learn about the Golden Plains Shire. And so we went along to a council dinner and got our Golden Plains induction. And the first thing on their list, the most important thing they had to impress on us is our municipality does not have a secondary school. Everybody has to leave. They all go to Geelong or they all go to Ballarat when they turn 12 or 13. And so Gail and I have been hammering away at this ever since. And there is a magnificent, very, very beautiful new school in Bannockburn now as a result of those budget decisions over the last three years. And health spending um, has been increased by $5 billion over our first two budgets um, and by nearly $3 billion in the last budget. Um, and we did reinstate funding to the National Centre for Pharma Health. I got a text message just a few minutes ago, actually, from Jill Hennessy, who's on her way to make an announcement about um, funding... No, but yet this is probably embargoed until she does it, but <laughs> um, ab about a significant funding for our palliative care service um, that supports rural communities. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that will, be, um, that will enable them to do things dramatically differently and to fill some of the gaps that exist in palliative care funding as well. So it's not just all hospitals. Um, you know, there's work to be done in preventative health. There's work to be done in filling the gaps that exist, that particularly people in rural areas and remote areas can be vulnerable to falling through in palliative care services and, and you name it. Um, and, and Jill was installed a few weeks ago with the Premier um, announcing a $2.2 million upgrade to the Stahl Hospital in the Northern Grampians Shire. So it's another um, example of um, our efforts on health funding. Um, last week, I think, while I was sitting on a beach, um, a further $50 million was announced for that regional health infrastructure fund and many of you will have seen projects in your community supported through that. And then, of course, there's the huge amount of work going on in regional rail. And for some communities, um, yeah, this, well, for most communities, this can't come fast enough and it can't come far enough as well. Um, but we're working with the Commonwealth to provide $1.7 billion in upgrade to the rail services. Um, every rail line, that huge Murray Basin rail project, which is just amazing and, and going great guns. Um, so just some of the uh, ways in which we are getting things done. Um, we've always been big believers in regional rail. It's not something we just talk about in election years. It's something we talk about all the time. Um, uh, it was the previous Labor government who championed regional fast rail and uh, the regional rail link project as well. And we will continue to talk about, but also to actually invest in regional rail. Um, but there's a lot to be... Um, a lot to be said about working locally on the things that matter most to regional communities and I always felt that there was a gap between all of the fabulous advocacy work that you all do and others in your communities do and how governments make decisions. And so what we, so what we did was institute regional partnerships as a way of bridging that gap and I think that it's, it's um, beginning to do that and it's something that I'm very proud of. Um, 
rural and regional communities have always been absolutely at the centre of Labor's regional policy. So in back in 99, the very first piece of um, legislation that went into the parliament was to establish the regional infrastructure um, uh, development Fund and Regional Development Victoria, um, which, you know, makes us all feel a bit old, I guess, but best part of 20 years ago, um, is the predecessor to what we have now. And RDV is going well. It is going um, strongly again. And the fund uh, that we have now, the Regional Jobs and Infrastructure Fund, is investing in communities and, and creating jobs across the state. And we're nearing in on 500 projects on the go, so it's very, very busy. There'll be one somewhere in your patch that you know of, if not several. But um, $322.5 million of grant funding as of the end of last year um, is supporting $1.3 billion of projects. So as you all know, because you're all you know, involved in it, um, these programs are designed to be able to kind of leverage extra investment and really sort of build, um, you know, build the investment and build the strength of the project. So one of the first things that I've that I did as regional development minister was to establish the Brumby Review. And I couldn't think of someone better to chair it, and I was very, very pleased to have John Brumby agree, um, former regional development minister as well as treasurer and premier, and um, a wonderful group of people who supported him. And the Brumby Review, um, if you haven't had a look at it for a while or if you've never had a look at it, have a look at it, the progress on implementing all of those recommendations, I think there was 68 of them, um, is going exceptionally well. Um, but through that review was born this idea that we can rearrange the government um, to reflect the, the very, very important um, idea that locals know best. Very simple, very strong message. And that led to the establishment of regional partnerships and regional assemblies. And the centrepiece of this approach was about directing your priorities and your community's priorities straight into the heart of cabinet decision making. And I know that there were some early anxieties about what this would mean for local councils, um, but I'm, I've certainly always been of the view, and, and, I, hope, um, and I hope that you are too, um, that they enhance your voice in no way that they replace it, and they're certainly never seeking to. Um, councils are critical members of regional partnerships, and to all of you who have contributed many, many more hours than you ever thought you would need to when this all first started, um, I thank you very much uh, for your effort. Um, more than 2,000 people attended our nine regional assemblies last year, giving us an extraordinary insight into the priorities and aspirations of people across regional Victoria. And it's not a competition, it's not, but Glen Elk had 350 people turn up. Um, so that was, uh, that was quite something. Uh, they are uh, miles ahead of Geelong, which I think... <laughs> So hooray for, yes, hooray for Glen Elg. Um, but, but they were all extraordinary and all unique, um, really, really important. And I know my colleagues, my colleagues love, love them and I certainly um, derive an enormous energy from them. And so we're up and running again for 2018. Um, Kyneton on the 3rd of May and then Stall, Kerrang, Hamilton, Ballarat, Wangaratta, Wonthaggy, Shepparton and Ocean Grove. It's... it's Half the challenge with these assemblies is finding a room big enough. Um, that actually does take up quite a lot of our time and energy um, because people have really embraced this reform. But each partnership has um, gathered information from the assemblies. The work continues year round and it does feed into government and budget decision making. And last year's budget met um, many specific priorities identified by partnerships, including projects in health, education, transport, housing, digital connectivity, regional tourism. Um, and the uh, state budget for this year will be delivered in just a few weeks on the 1st of May and will be delivering on many of the priorities um, identified by our regional partnerships. 
Um, regional partnerships are fundamental for um, supporting the delivery of big projects and small projects um, alike, but also really importantly for changing policy. And there's a very, very good example um, underway in Wimmera Southern Mallee where um, they are designing with the department of education and I think the Department of Health may be helping as well, um, they are designing um, a, an alternative model for delivery of early year services. And so, um, yes, everybody loves a big infrastructure project, but I think some of the beauty of this reform will be in actually redesigning the way services are delivered to remote um, and to smaller rural communities. But of course, digital connectivity I wanted to talk to you a bit about. Um, understandably one of the hottest issues in our regions. Uh, you would all spend lots of time every week saying, what, what, what did you say? Sorry, can you, it's dropping out, right? This drives us all completely insane. Um, in fact, last night I saw the ABC News and there was a story about an elderly couple, I don't know if anybody else saw this, an, an elderly couple that um, have had NBN connected and now their home phone doesn't work. And so you, know, you think about the risks of, well, just you know, managing different health conditions, fires and floods. So having um, having a landline for people who don't have other communication is incredibly important basic service. Um, rural communities do depend on their telecommunications, and better digital connectivity um, not only um, keeps us safe in emergencies, but also creates opportunities and reduces costs and can, we believe, smash the geographic barriers faced by our smaller communities. Um, the one thing that really resonated with me of all of the hundreds and hundreds of frustrating and maddening stories I've heard from people over the years about poor digital connectivity. Um, in June of 2016, um, I was in a dairy shed. The dairy prices had just fallen through the floor and our dairy industry was in a state of great turmoil and shock. And um, we were sitting around in the shed and it was about two degrees in the sun. And um, and the people around the table were talking about how difficult it was for them to access Centrelink payments, to access the farm household allowance, which is basic income support. And the problem was because these systems are now all completely online based. It's not like there's a Centrelink office within, you know, a three hour drive or whatever. Um, and, and this woman brought to the meeting this stack of paper this big. And she said, this is, like, this is what we have to upload, or, you know, all the farm finance information. And then she said, and the problem is, only place that you can get a connection that's decent enough to like, upload all of those scanned documents or photo JPEGs of documents is at the local Maccas. And every other dairy farmer in the district is down there. So, like, the indignity of queuing up to get an internet connection at Macca's um, was just horrific. It was absolutely heartbreaking. And so we wanted to do something about this. Um, rural communities do have a very dig different digital experience to people in cities like Melbourne. And it can be hard to do business, it can be hard to access information, of course, to make phone calls. Um, so we, wanna, uh, we wanted to do something to address the digital divide and it was something that all nine regional partnerships said was a really high priority, like it just came through time and time again. And so our government's invested now over $100 million in regional digital infrastructure investments, um, removing mobile black spots. And yes, there's more to do, we know that, but they're slowly, slowly being tackled. Fixing mobile coverage on the V-line commuter routes and improving digital connectivity for regional schools. Um, but really importantly, this new program, the $45 million Connecting Regional Communities Program. Um, and, and, and as we're putting this together before the last state budget, we were really conscious that like telecommunications is plain as day a responsibility of the federal government. And, you know, we're not in the business of looking, you know, letting them off the hook. We're also not in the business of, you know, trying to replicate or duplicate the, their ongoing work on NBN. Um, but connecting regional communities um, is a program that does 
um, what we think a state government can do uh, to uh, help and to alleviate some of the challenges of digital connectivity. So there's upgrade, upgrading of broadband infrastructure for regional businesses um, where the existing telecommunications infrastructure isn't working. Um, there, uh, we're extending the um, free public Wi-Fi program and also undertaking an Internet of Things demonstration uh, project in three different regions, uh, sorry, four different regions in the northwest, McAllister, Serpentine and the Goulburn Murray region and that's Internet on Farms technology uh, for farmers. So, you know, where your devices talk to each other, basically. Um, very cool and somebody digital and technological could explain it much, much better. But, um, but absolutely the way of the future in terms of, you know, efficiently managing farm businesses. Um, and so we do know that a one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to work. You know, some of you are in rapidly growing communities, some of you are in communities that have um, experienced uh, changes to your industries and population decline now for 20, 25 years. Um, and so it's not horses for courses. So um, not wanting to have a one-size-fits-all approach, what we are doing and what I'm pleased to announce to you today um, is that we are providing million dollars to develop to create nine digital regional plans and so each regional partnership uh, will develop their own region's regional strategy. Um, this will um, bring together the most comprehensive and up-to-date information on each regional's digital infrastructure and services, so really, really clearly defining the problem, um, like forensically um, defining the problem, but also uh, properly understanding the opportunities. And our rural councils have played a critical role in helping to identify and advocate for this, um, for the digital connectivity that we believe you deserve. And our government will continue to work closely with councils um, throughout the development of these plans and advocate for a fair share from the Commonwealth. So these digital plans will help us lift our advocacy game to the next level. They'll audit and effectively map digital connectivity throughout rural and regional Victoria so that we can identify um, new products and services and projects that will bridge the existing digital gaps. And then it'll be used as a basis to plan projects with the Commonwealth Government. So, um, this is... You know, this is the way of the future. Um, our agri agriculture, which I know is very important to... Um, almost all of your communities, um, is one of the least digitised sectors in the Australian economy. And so there's a lot of really great potential there. Um, so our um, business is um, ongoing investment in schools and hospitals, transport, digital infrastructure, job creation, and the things that are fundamental to regional Victoria. It's a key also to the population challenge. And I know... Um, uh, you know, Rob and I talked about it most recently a few weeks ago, but Rural Councils Victoria has a strong focus on population growth and population retention. And this, of course, means different things to different communities. Um, it would be a very brave councillor that would go down to the main street of Torquay or somewhere in the Macedon Ranges and say, we're going to double your population. Um, but conversely, for many other communities, population growth means... Services means retail, it means um, you know, a stronger and more vibrant community and it's a very, very different proposition to areas that are managing the pressures of too much population growth. So RCVs study population attraction and retention strategies for rural Victorian communities, uh, predicts many rural peri-urban councils that surround Melbourne and other large regional cities will experience uh, that steady population growth going forward while others are projected on average to become older as they have been and to experience population contraction. You talk to parents and grandparents in any regional town or community and they'll tell you that they want their kids to be able to choose to live and work in the community that they grew up in. Um, our government is making this more affordable. Uh, last year, we doubled the first homeowners grant in regional Victoria and abolished stamp duty for first home buyers for purchases below $600,000, which is a reasonable share of the properties available for purchase in our regions. Um, in the eight months to February of this year, 
Almost 14,000 first home buyers across Victoria paid no stamp duty and another 3,200 paid reduced stamp duty. Over 35% or nearly 5,000 of the first home buyers who paid no stamp duty purchased a home in rural and regional Victoria. So again, think about that relative to our, pop our country city population split in Victoria. Um, Borbore, Mitchell, Bass Coast, Moorabool and East Gippsland are some of the rural councils with the highest take up rates. And the doubling of the first homeowners grant has seen over 1,300 buyers receive the $20,000 first homeowner grant. Um, we've not been afraid to explore innovative tax policies and particularly, you know, credits due to the Treasurer for his embracing of and championing of um, these types of ideas. Um, payroll tax uh, is cheaper in regional Victoria now than it is in Melbourne and more than 2,000 businesses across regional Victoria have taken advantage of the payroll tax cuts. Um, saving businesses more than $31 million, like that's $31 million extra that is now in your communities. Um, it's either in your communities as uh, um, accrued wealth, it's most likely in your communities as um, uh, distributed through additional wages and certainly anecdotally um, the Premier hears this wherever he goes, the Treasurer hears this, I hear this, um, that people have taken those savings and they've invested in their businesses or they've expanded their businesses. The payroll tax rate was slashed um, by 25% last year, so from 4.85% to 3.65%, um, making it one of the most competitive payroll tax rates in the country. Um, so investments in Roads, rail, digital health and education are key, um, but so also are providing the incentives for people to live, work and invest in regional and rural Victoria. And you're hearing from James Flintoft, I believe, a bit later today, and James will probably talk to you a bit about that. And um, again, thank you all for you know, the wonderful contributions you've made um, uh, to the Ready When You Are campaign. Just absolutely beautiful snapshots of your communities. Um, so it's not all talk. We are getting things done. Um, and these are the things um, you know, that we will continue to focus on, um, particularly that record employment growth. Um, so you have Matthew Guy coming a bit later in the day as well and um, I suspect he'll probably talk to you about how a future coalition government would redirect population growth across regional Victoria, um, which is very much, um, you know, their, their focus in terms of dealing with congestion issues in Melbourne. Um, one of their other... Um, Melbourne congestion busting ideas is um, to spend the proceeds of snowy hydro on intersections in Melbourne. Um, I want to reassure you that we will be taking a different approach. Um, we will be spending the proceeds of the $2 billion um, sale of snowy hydro um, for the benefit of all, uh, all of regional Victoria. Um, but I certainly, um, you know, we, we, we are concerned that past behaviour um, can be a good predictor of future behaviour. Um, the Coalition have said that they'll have a commission of audit in their first 100 days if elected. Um, that sounds all very accountancy and kind of inoffensive, but usually this is their roadmap for budget cuts. So, I'd, you know, we will certainly be encouraging them to commit to no cuts to services um, in Victoria. Um, we want to make sure that regional Victoria gets a fair share, whether it's through the snow, snowy hydro sales proceeds or our infrastructure spending and certainly in those services like health and education. Um, so getting those fundamentals right, getting things done, working very, very closely with communities in genuine partnership with a, a policy decision making a process that informs budget and that goes straight to Cabinet. Um, creating those incentives for businesses in regional Victoria and people who want to move to regional Victoria as well as their own residents um, who want to buy their first home. Um, so there's more to do. I'm most definitely not allowed to tell you what's in the state budget, um, but I can absolutely assure you there will be a really strong budget for, your regions, for our regions and for your communities. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you um, some of the things that we've been focused on and will continue to be focused on, and I look forward to hearing of the outcomes of your forum as always. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jala, and uh, I'm very pleased to hear your comments on the Snowy River because that was one of the uh, questions we did ask the Minister when we met um, a few days ago. 
So you've answered that very well, and then the Treasurer will get his checkbook out on Friday, so we'll be laughing. We uh, only have a couple of minutes, so if you could please identify yourself, make your question short, and um, the Minister will try and answer it. So do we have any questions for the Minister? Thank you, Minister, and uh, Ron Janis from the uh, Alpine Shire. Uh, my question is, and uh, we've certainly been recipients of state funding in our area, but um, is government considering increasing um, untied funding to small and uh, rural councils? Um, we appreciate the fact that there's funding available for libraries and halls and that, but we don't all need libraries and halls um, and other infrastructure, perhaps, that um, uh, is surplus to our requirements. But we do need some extra money for um, other basic infrastructures uh, that might not necessarily uh, be within that budget guideline. So I believe that all councils here in this room um, manage their budgets well, hmm. but and I, and I think we should be given the... Uh, acknowledgement and credence to say, well, here's a bucket of money, you spend it on what you think your community needs. Um, so I think that is an important consideration for government to um, increase that funding. Yeah, OK. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so we have um, consciously taken a different approach um, to... Uh, that of the former government. Um, we wanted to shift the focus of the regional fund to um, economic outcomes and job creation, uh, and and we did that really quite deliberately. Um, the untied... So, untied grants to councils is um, not... Ha ..has not been a way that we've sought to deal with the rural council financial sustainability question. Um, and I concur completely with your observation of how rural councils manage their budgets. Um, I know I was having a cuppa with Rob, do you remember this? We were in nil about like two days after my colleagues announced the rate capping policy. And I said to Rob then, like this is, like when you hear um, uh, my colleagues talking about, you know, this outrageous excess in um, uh, council spending, like, please be assured that it's not about you guys. Like, it's just not. You know, it was this sort of wild expenditure in these, you know, hun multi-hundred million dollar organisations in Melbourne where we were seeing some pretty wacky stuff. Um, and I know that Natalie Hutchins, when she was your minister, um, worked very... Um, well, we worked closely together and, um, and very carefully to design the way that that would work. Um, Marlene Carews has been doing um, a, a great deal of work and um, Rural Councils Victoria have, of course, too, around how to actually deal with the budget sustainability and funding pressures problem. Um, but our... Um, our approach has been to uh, focus on where the area of need is. So, um, so for instance, like an example I can give you is the $25 million for um, uh, local roads, local roads to markets, um, where the funding was made available and councils could propose their project. And I think every council that proposed their project was successful. Somebody might correct me if I'm wrong, but there were a couple of councils that have multiple projects and, um, and most were able to achieve theirs. Um, you know, we've increased funding to, um, you know, lots and lots of different services that you provide. And, I, you know, I understand completely the budget pressures that some of you experience and, and that for some of you um, it's incredibly acute. And, you know, there's a, an underlying problem there um, that, you know, that we all need to tackle together. One more question down the back there, yes. Uh, Tony Driscoll. Northern Grand um, Our rural road network is ageing and obviously needs a, a massive spend. I think uh, the capacity of rural rate payers to uh, maintain our road network is far beyond them. And I think for us to maintain a vibrant rural economy, uh, we need a significant investment in our rural road network. What's your commitment to providing and upgrading our? 
Um, thanks, Tony. I, um, well, I certainly, uh, you know, the problem is well known and well understood. Um, the roads minister, the treasurer also um, well understand uh, this challenge. We have increased funding to roads um, fairly significantly and there's a budget in three weeks.